Welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Aya Bruela, an advisor at the Research Institute for European and American Studies, join us to discuss what are Turkey's goals in Libya? Can they be achieved? Ms. Bruela will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Ms. Aya Berwela. Sorry, you're muted. I'm mute, all right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stacy, and uh, thank you to the Middle East Forum for having me here today. Uh, so the subject of the forum is, what is Turkey's uh, goals in Libya and are they achievable? Uh, whenever I speak about Libya, and we have only 15 minutes today, and usually just to go through the entire context of the conflict, uh, which if you ask me, uh, it was seeded even before the intervention in 2011, uh, but in 2010, uh, 15 minutes is not enough to go through the entire context. So I'll try to be as uh, brief as possible. Uh, if you want to look at the roots of this conflict, the second, uh, the second uh, escalation uh, of this conflict, we need to understand uh, who's who in Libya, uh, who are the actors, uh, before we go into uh, discussing who is supporting them, uh, one of which is Turkey. Uh, the biggest divide that we see today between the East and the West, and I have to uh, identify that it's not East and West uh, uh, amongst people, it is a geographical uh, divide, uh, was the 2014 elections. Uh, the last uh, democratic elections Libya has had. Uh, in these 2014 elections, uh, Islamist parties uh, had lost uh, resoundingly. And at that point, uh, they had uh, staged a coup uh, against the elected parliament. Uh, this was called Operation Libya Dawn. Uh, and since then, the parliament was uh, relocated to Tobruk in the east, uh, and the capital was basically captured by militias. Uh, in 2015, uh, the UN attempted to resolve the situation and they brokered a third uh, government uh, called the GNA. Uh, the GNA uh, was created by the Libyan political agreement, uh, which stipulated that the GNA had to be ratified uh, by the elected parliament, which is also UN recognized. And these are little details that often uh, aren't mentioned in mainstream media, yet they're very, very crucial because they're one of the main drivers of the conflict. So it was never ratified, uh, and yet uh, the GNA became recognized uh, as international representatives and the, and the government of Libya. And since then, there has been a conflict. Uh, however, uh, one of the problems with the GNA uh, was that it actually had uh, no physical control uh, over the country. Uh, it was parachuted into the country, uh, as you remember, and it was unable to cope uh, with the dire security uh, situation uh, in the capital with the militias, Libya Dawn, for example. And uh, despite its mandate, uh, along with the national army to dismantle these militias, it was unable to do so. And we found a situation where the militias had actually co-opted by force uh, many state institutions. Uh, this caused a variety of problems, not just security problems uh, for Libyans, but also financial and economic problems uh, when they captured, when basically they, they'd have Libyan banks at gunpoint and forcing Libyan banks to actually finance them. So this was a very difficult, this is the kind of, this is the context of uh, the present conflict before the April offensive of the LNA against Tripoli. So who were these militias? And these militias, uh, Libya Dawn, among, among other militias, uh, were supported uh, by Turkey and Qatar. Uh, it is a fallacy to believe that uh, the support uh, Turkey has shown uh, to Libya Dawn and other Islamist militias uh, started after the April 19 offensive. There has been uh, multiple cases uh, where the Greek Coast Guard has stopped uh, ships uh, full of weapons uh, being sent uh, to Libya by Turkey. Uh, so, Finally, uh, as you know, Libya was also uh, one of the fourth, uh, the site of one of the uh, largest mobilization of foreign fighters in jihadist history. In fact, it was uh, the recipient of the fourth uh, largest mobilization. 
And at some point, uh, we had ISIS uh, base, uh, Al-Qaeda, and back in, in Derna, uh, which, which only had a, a base in Derna because they managed to get rid of ISIS. Uh, this was the context as well. Uh, the LNA managed to remove uh, uh, these terrorist organizations uh, in the East, uh, including Ansar al-Sharia, uh, the Benghazi Mujahideen Shura Council. And while most people were surprised, I mean, analysts were surprised at April 2019 of the offensive, it was actually no secret uh, that the final phase uh, was to remove the militias uh, in Tripoli. And what is often not discussed is that this is a mutual mandate between the GNA uh, and the LNA. Uh, they were both tasked to remove these militias and uh, to absorb uh, all these militias uh, that popped up in Libya after 2011 uh, to integrate them into one national force. Uh, so there were multiple talks like in Paris and, and Cairo and Abu Dhabi uh, to agree to, uh, to get rid of the militias together. However, uh, the GNA was not forthcoming. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, uh, uh, the parliament uh, uh, which supports the national army is that they were too close to Turkey and Qatar. Uh, there is an impression that uh, no decision is taken uh, in the GNA without um, first getting the green light of uh, Turkey and Qatar. So what are, and this is another point about Turkey and Qatar, when we're looking at such a regional conflict, important conflict, uh, we can't, there are, much, there are more actors than just uh, Turkey or uh, Egypt, uh, 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 which, is which is mentioned in the invite. Uh, it's like a game of risk. You have to see there are blocks of countries uh, supporting each side. So it's not just Turkey's objectives in Libya are also Qatar's objective. As David Roberts, uh, uh, one of the leading experts of Qatar uh, today said, Turkey and uh, Qatar work hand in glove. So these are so this is one block that's supporting the GNA, uh, and the other block is uh, Egypt uh, and uh, UAE and uh, in many in France. Uh, and this is also in an important counterterrorism uh, uh, context. So what are the goals uh, of Turkey? Uh, I think it's quite clear what the goal is. Uh, Erdogan talks about it every day, and he's. Uh, He's not known for mincing his words. Uh, the goals of Turkey uh, is, uh, is best illustrated by uh, the maritime and military cooperation agreement uh, signed with the GNA uh, this time last year. Uh, the maritime agreement, uh, which infringes on uh, the sovereign rights of uh, countries like Egypt, uh, Libya itself, uh, uh, Greece and Cyprus, uh, it all has one aspect has to do access uh, to these uh, these gas reserves in the region, and uh, another is uh, to stop uh, to be part of any agreement uh, pipeline agreements uh, between uh, uh, Greece and uh, Cyprus and uh, and Egypt. So one goal is to influence and to get access to gas reserves. Uh, another goal is to set up uh, a haven and a hub of influence in Africa. Uh, Turkey has been uh, increasing its activities in uh, Africa, and Libya is one of the most strategic points it has because it is right across Europe on the Mediterranean. And of course, there's Libya's oil reserves. Uh, gaining access to Libya's oil reserves and uh, federal reserves in the Central Bank of Libya is a huge priority for Turkey. Uh, Turkey's economy is failing. Uh, and Libya is seen as one of the countries uh, Turkey can use to help prop itself up uh, economically. Uh, only in, in the past few months, uh, multiple agreements have been signed, uh, economic and military agreements have been signed between the GNA and Turkey. And here's a point that uh, is very important for uh, my audience to take note of, is that these military agreements between the GNA and Turkey are all void uh, by dint of the fact that any agreement uh, that is passed uh, between the government and a foreign country has to go through the parliament first. It has to be signed off by the parliament uh, and ratified. So all these agreements, including the maritime agreement and the military cooperation agreement uh, are void and unconstitutional in Libya. Another more uh, worry for a worrisome aspect for international uh, 
security is Turkey's goal of uh, having, a, having a hub for its auxiliary army, the Syrian National Army. Uh, this is uh, the Syrian National Army uh, is Turkey's auxiliary army. Uh, it uses it in its foreign adventures. Uh, they're mercenaries, uh, they're militant jihadists. Uh, they have absorbed um, uh, Daesh. And they've already sent between estimates between 5,000 and 6,000 uh, fighters to Libya. So they're creating a little military uh, haven, uh, a base. Uh, for their auxiliary army. And when you couple that with the fact that uh, uh, Libya, the west of Libya, is a transit point um, for migration, uh, it becomes a very uh, worrisome prospect uh, for Europe. Uh, your, uh, Turkey uh, uh, can now control the illegal tra uh, human trafficking routes. And as we saw uh, last week, uh, with the Paris attacks, uh, oh, one of the attackers uh, was a Tunisian national who uh, came to Europe uh, via Lampedusa. Uh, and we have also seen uh, er er Erdogan's readiness to exploit migrants and to exploit their tragedy and exploit refugees uh, and to weaponize them uh, against countries. Having failed to do that last year in Evros, the north of Greece, uh, I do believe one of their goals is to um, have the possibility to do the same via Libya, to have a military card by which you can blackmail Europe. So that's one of its goals. Has it achieved uh, these goals? Well, this is something that time will tell and it will also be highly dependent on what, um, uh, what uh, uh, Libya, what the HOR, what the parliament and the army's allies will do to stop Libya. So far, uh, from what I see, the Turkey was unable to advance on the oil crescent in Libya. Uh, in fact, there has been positive developments recently uh, uh, from the UN vis-a-vis uh, -vis the security situation in Libya. Uh, the, GNA, uh, the GNA and the LNA have come to an agreement uh, there has been a ceasefire. Uh, there has been an agreement to remove all mercenaries from Libya, including Tur Turkish and Russian mercenaries. Uh, so this has been a very, uh, there has been a good development from the security point uh, in the Libyan conflict. However, Turkey was not happy uh, with the ceasefire uh, it, because it, it stipulates that it, uh, it has to remove uh, its mercenaries. And also they are unable to advance uh, thanks to the Egyptian, the very strong uh, Egyptian uh, stance uh, on Libya, they were unable to advance to the oil crescent. So they're kind of stuck right now uh, in the West with nothing to show for it after, uh, for years. Uh, what we saw happen, and this is why I mentioned that it is very important when you're looking at Libya to look at all the actors, the blocks of alliances uh, that are at play in Libya. After the five plus five agreement, the Geneva uh, ceasefire, uh, Qatar had announced another military cooperation with the GNA, which by the way is illegal. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just as illegal as all the other military uh, cooperations. So what we saw is that Turkey has passed the baton uh, to Qatar. And obviously they, want, uh, they're, uh, they wish to uh, keep getting involved. I don't see how, um, Via, uh, via the, the militias in the West. Uh, so have they achieved their goals yet? They haven't achieved their goals yet. Uh, I expect there will be further tactics uh, uh, to sabotage a peace process. Uh, but what I see today uh, are some positive developments uh, from the security standpoints. It seems all the, uh, many countries have put their foot down and said, this is enough. And I'm now open to any questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, so the first question we have in is, uh, what presence does ISIS have in Libya today? Well, if you can expand upon that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the presence is, uh, is not as strong as it once was, obviously. Uh, 2019, we saw nine, uh, around nine terrorist attacks uh, seven, of them, seven of them were by ISIS, all of them were directed against uh, the LNA. Uh, to me, what is important in Libya is not to just focus on brand names like ISIS. Uh, 
I prefer to focus on militant jihadists. It's not only ISIS that can carry out terrorist attacks or undermine security uh, in, uh, in the country. So they're in the back and they're in, uh, they're definitely on the back foot. Uh, and there's been some progress against them. One of their, their uh, emir in, uh, in Libya had been uh, killed recently uh, in October, I believe. So there has been progress. They aren't, they aren't as strong as they used to be. Understood, thank you. And what do you think the prospects for oil production and export are? Uh, they're very good. <laughs> well, there's been a blockade uh, uh, for many months. And the reason uh, for that blockade goes back to the whole problem about the militias capturing state institutions and where does Libyan money go? Uh, there's been a, so the paradox of Libya is that uh, you had, so you, we had our oil production uh, back on track, but the money was going to militias <laughs> that in turn attack uh, the army that uh, exploit and plunder institutions and make elections or anything like that uh, impossible. So there was a blockade. Uh, recently, there was the Norland and uh, Maitig and uh, Haftardir, which agreed to open uh, the oil again. But it, there was a stipulation to that opening in that there should be oversight on where the money goes, where the oil pr proceeds go. And this is something we have to see in the coming weeks. What are the arrangements going to be? Is, it, uh, are, is there finally going to be audits of the central bank? Uh, is there going to be oversight on where Libya money goes to? Is there going to be equal distribution of uh, revenues between the east and the west and the south? So this is something uh, to be determined. Thank you. Um, so going back to the oil production and export, who actually is controlling that currently? So the LNA uh, has control, physical uh, control of uh, the oil crescent. Uh, so what you're, what you're asking is where, where is the money going? <laughs> and who decides where, how the money is spent? Who has that, that control? Because while the LNA and, and uh, technically the HOR and the LNA uh, have control physically of the oil crescent, the question is where does the money go and uh, who controls that? That's the most important part. And that, uh, that is a CBL, the Central Bank of Libya, but, uh, and the Libyan Foreign Bank. That's where, that's where the money goes. The governor of the CBL uh, controls oil proceeds. And here's something many people don't know. The governor of the Libyan CBL has been fired twice by the parliament. The last time it was in 2014 and he has never left. And he has resisted audits uh, in fact, the Americans have been pressuring uh, very much for an audit. And uh, for obvious reasons, he's very, very close to the Muslim Brotherhood and even more so to Turkey. He has resisted to do so. This is a problem. But after the uh, Norland uh, Haftar Meitig uh, oil deal, they're trying to resolve this problem. Uh, more transparency, uh, more equitable revenue um, uh, sharing and oversight. So we don't know. I can't. I can't tell you right now who's going to be controlling. I, I hope the right people. I hope people who are answered to the uh, to a parliament. Uh, I hope there's going to be more legitimacy uh, moving forward. Along those lines, can the EU play a positive role in curbing Turkey and, and getting them to work with the LNA instead of the GNA? Well, the GNA wants to work with the LNA. Uh, that was the whole idea <laughs> uh, to work with the national army. You cannot have uh, you cannot have foreign troops co-opting local militias and fighting uh, the national army. I know that uh, LNA has been receiving bad press since 2017. Uh, uh, but it's not, you know, we talk about countries are supporting the LNA, but we never talk about do Libyans support the LNA. Uh, the majority of Libyans do. And this is a, this is a study out of a study from USAID, uh, from the Arab uh, Opinion Barometer. Uh, the LNA, uh, the, the head of the LNA has been appointed uh, by the parliament in 2015. This is a legitimate process. The aim is to dismantle the militias. This is actually the mandate of the GNA as well, to dismantle the militias which is one of the hugest problems uh, Libya's faced after 2011. I think the EU can play a huge role. It has to play a huge role because things have gone totally out of control. Uh, you cannot have a country that's going rogue, sending thousands and thousands to mercenaries uh, to, an, to the Mediterranean. <laughs> 
this is dangerous. Uh, uh, this is unheard of. And a country that has been so aggressive about violating the sovereignty of other countries and economic rights of other countries, and who has adopted a very aggressive uh, Islamist and jihadist rhetoric uh, that I feel it can, uh, uh, spurs radicalization and legitimate, uh, legitimizes radicalization, uh, the EU can definitely play uh, uh, and should play a bigger role in Libya, but it, it, it's important that it plays a positive role. And the best way, uh, in my opinion, that it can play a positive role is to foster legitimacy, uh, to foster elections, uh, to be guarantors of elections, uh, to, uh, to have expertise transfers to Libya in, in the judiciary, uh, to create mechanisms where Libyan funds uh, are uh, under some sort of oversight. Uh, because before it's it's been like a slush fund for <laughs> every criminal. <laughs> it's it's a paradise. It's a I, I call I call the capital gangsters paradise. Uh, there is no there's human when you have human traffickers working with a UN recognized government. It's like it's it's making criminality part of part of the official regime. So there's a lot of uh, uh, corruption that needs to be combated. There are a lot of weapons uh, that need to be decommissioned. There needs to be a lot of militias uh, that need to be um, uh, either uh, uh, neutralized or to be reabsorbed into an official army. Because it's okay if a, if a man wants to be a soldier, uh, but you, you can't be, you can't be um, part of a militia cartel. There needs to be a, a law and order. If you want to fight, if you want to be a soldier, uh, you're, everybody's more than welcome to go to military academy and join a formal army. Uh, so the EU ha, uh, can play a huge role and has to pay, play a huge role uh, because what happens in Libya does have consequences, not just for Libyans, but for the region as well. Of course. And with the elections going on in the United States, it's uh, something we're all looking at quite closely. But how do you think the a new U.S. administration would handle the Erdogan handle Erdogan differently in Libya and elsewhere. That's a very, very good question. Um, I don't see. I I listen to politicians, but I always take uh, the word of politicians in a grain of salt. Uh, actions speak louder than words, uh, because in the previous uh, in the previous administration, we uh, not. Uh, in the Obama administration, uh, we expected uh, world peace, we expected so much. And yet in that period, the Middle East had suffered greatly. <laughs> we saw ISIS going through a renaissance. Uh, we saw the, uh, the Libyan intervention, which is very ill-managed uh, in the aftermath. Uh, so we, right now we just have, we have words and intentions to go by. I believe uh, Biden has a very strong uh, anti-Turkish stance, but we have to remember that presidents aren't uh, autocrats. <laughs> uh, there's Congress, uh, there are lobbies, uh, there's a media, all these things influence uh, what a president, a president does and does not do and what he can and cannot do. Uh, so there are two blocks. Many people think uh, Biden will take a strong stance against uh, Turkey. Uh, which would be incredibly welcome uh, throughout the Arab world and throughout Europe. Uh, but I, uh, I, don't, I don't have opinions. I don't make such projections uh, in American politics until you, know, until you see actual action being taken, so. Of course. Um, so how do you see Al Siraj's resignation and its eventual postponement? Well, that's very interesting. So, as Siraj uh, wanted to resign. I think there were many members of the GNA that did not realize how bad it was going to be uh, when Turkey, uh, Turkey arrived uh, in Libya. So the GNA was never elected by the Libyan people. Uh, it was never ratified the, by the parliament and it was uh, expired in December 17, 2017. Uh, they enjoy very, very little legitimacy, if at all, amongst the Libyan people. Uh, but as you all know, it's human nature. Nobody wants to let go of power. <laughs> so they stayed on. Uh, they adopted the militias they were supposed to dismantle. And however, there was a huge backlash to the GNA locally, especially, uh, especially after Turkey began uh, sending Syrian mercenaries to Libya. 
uh, I don't think even the GNA, uh, they're, they're, they're considered locally. Of course, they have their minority of supporters, but the, the entire country sees uh, the GNA as a conduit of uh, foreign occupation. Uh, Turkey literally invaded Libya. <laughs> it's, uh, it's occupying it. And it's occupying, not only do we have uh, Turkish officers in Libya right now, we have Syrian mercenaries. And this, uh, this caused a huge backlash uh, within, within even supporters of the GNA. So Siraj, I think he, um, uh, and he realized that the Turks aren't there to help Libyans. The Turks, the Turks are there to plunder. <laughs> Uh, you know, they've, they've held speeches in, 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 in the West uh, to Turkish officers in closed auditoriums without even Libyans present inside. I mean, this was, this was very, very insulting to Libyans. So, so I think Siraj did not want to be, um, he, because he has, he has no ability to take autonomous uh, decision making. Everything he does, it has to go through Turkey or Qatar. And, and perhaps he did not like, uh, I cannot speak for him, I'm not in his heart or mind. But uh, my estimation is that uh, it, things went totally out of his control and uh, became much worse than he expected. And he just wanted to resign. However, he was not allowed to resign. And the reason for that is because Turkey does not want to lose its, uh, its proxy. Because until now, Siraj has been doing what they wanted, <laughs> uh, regardless of the consequences on Libyan unity, Libyan security, uh, Libyan economic justice. So the fact that he has been stopped from resigning is really telling about the influence of foreign countries exert on the GNA. And a follow up on that, uh, Russia is also welcoming his uh, withdrawal of the resignation. Can you comment on that? Well, nobody, uh, I think this is something universally, uh, it was, uh, people are so disappointed with Siraj's uh, rule that it, uh, except for Turkey and Qatar, who has used, see, see the GNA is a political proxy of these two countries. Everybody has welcomed uh, <laughs> this resignation. Uh, it could not have come uh, soon enough, but as we see, it's being blocked. Uh, it's, uh, nobody wants to lose, you know, Siraj, Bashaga, Mishri. These guys are Turkey's men in Libya. Uh, they represent their interests, not living interests. Uh, but I guess Siraj wanted to uh, do the right thing, or he did not want to be part of uh, this uh, anymore, uh, and wished to resign. And yet they're not allowing him. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, so, in our last few minutes here, can you just give us some policy recommendations you, you think should? Absolutely. Um, First and foremost, uh, the Libyan the uh, proceeds uh, from uh, Libyan oil needs to go uh, to a bank account uh, with oversight. The Libyan foreign bank has to have oversight. Uh, audits must continue. Uh, they must be published. Uh, and if there are any embezzlements or corruption, the people responsible for that have to be held accountable. This is number one, economic justice, anti-corruption measures. Uh, and as you know, anti-corruption measures uh, need the help of uh, other countries as well. Uh, money laundering is a huge problem. Uh, this requires cooperation uh, by foreign countries as well. Second of all, legitimacy. Uh, there's no peace without legitimacy. And Libyans want a government chosen by them for them. They want, in other words, elections and democracy. What's been happening so far is the circumvention uh, of Libyan self-determination. So for example, in 2014, when Libyans went to vote uh, and they voted out the Islamists, uh, the UN came along and said, well, you know what? This is, you know, uh, <laughs> here's a third government, the GNA. <laughs> and Libyans were like, wait, we got bombed so we can have elections and we can choose our own uh, government. But since we didn't choose Islamists, who most normal people won't, uh, this is a tragedy of Libya. Libya is not a country where the Muslim Brotherhood has indigenous uh, popularity or anything like that. That is not our brand of Islam. So, so Libyans want to, and since then, we've been in a disaster zone for six years. Our development has been destroyed. Uh, militias have been empowered. We have a Turkish boots on the ground. So we want now a government uh, for Libyans, by Libyans. And the only way to achieve that is elections. UNSMO, uh, it, it seems to me that UNSMO is trying to repeat a GNA 2.0. 
there's something called the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum, and which is a very strange, uh, um, a strange project by UNSMO that uh, Libyans are protesting against right, left, and center. People who hate the GNA are protesting. People who like the GNA are protesting. Libyans are protesting because what UNSMO came and said is that we're choosing a group of Libyans to choose an interim government to prepare for elections. This is a game. <laughs> and a quarter of them are Muslim Brotherhood. There are people in this dialogue that were actual advocates of terror. <laughs> and Libyans are up in arms. So this is a way, it looks like something nice and sweet and legitimate, but it is another way to circumvent uh, elections, creating a group appointing the, the UN is appointing a group of people, not the Libyans, uh, appointing a group of people to choose another interim government. And we know what happened the last time we had an interim government. It was called the GNA. <laughs> and it turned out to be a huge proxy for Turkey and Qatar. So Libyans are definitely sick and tired of uh, foreign countries usurping their right to self-determination. They want elections. Uh, to me, it's the most, it's so basic. And it, want, uh, uh, and it wishes to have uh, countries who can guarantee the results of the elections. In 2014, we did not have external guarantors, uh, which is what uh, allowed the Islamist militias to invade Tripoli and to force uh, the parliament out. So we need to have elections, fair uh, and open and democratic elections observed by third countries to make sure you know, there's no funny business. And that uh, and foreign country, yeah, <laughs> and foreign countries to act as guarantors of these results. And of course, expertise transfer from Europe, the United States, uh, to help rebuild the country, jobs, uh, labor market integration, uh, because Libya cannot, as most Arab countries, it is not a country that should be so oil dependent anymore. Uh, it's uh, you, even you saw with the oil prices recently, you cannot be dependent on fluctuations of the oil market. Uh, you cannot have a government that props up uh, uh, everybody. <laughs> what happens when the government uh, runs out of, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, of money that, are, that is completely dependent on oil funds. So these are some policy recommendations. And of course, uh, with the UN Security Council, we cannot have, we are still under uh, arms embargo from 2011. <laughs> you cannot apply an arms embargo from 2011 to 2020. Uh, the army, we, army, the army does not want to cooperate with mercenaries. <laughs> it does not need to have uh, cooperate with mercenaries. It wants to cooperate with other national armies. If it has its own weapons, uh, we cannot lump militias and, and the formal army together. Uh, Libya did not have much of an army to begin with, even in the Gaddafi era, because he was always paranoid about uh, Gaddafi was always paranoid about the army. But Libya is a huge country. Uh, he has a huge coastline, huge, uh, huge borders with the desert. Uh, it needs to be able to protect itself as well. So a revision of the arms embargo is another um, policy recommendation. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for speaking with us today. I, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Stacey. No, my to, of course. Uh, we've come to the close of our webinar. For our viewers, please be on the lookout for our weekly webinar offerings email over the weekend. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Have a good one.